Glenn Ella started his shooting career as a sporting clays competitor. In fact, in 1996, he won the World Junior English Sporting title. He quickly got a taste for the Olympic disciplines and went on to win an Olympic gold medal in Beijing in 2008. Glenn can shoot trap just as good as he can shoot doubles. In 2018, he was the top qualifier in the World Olympic Trap Championship. And in that same year, he was also top qualifier with 124 out of 125 at the Cat games. Let's have a closer look at the workings of the USA's Glen Ella. Okay, I'm continuing on with our series of champions. We've got a guy now that, of course, everyone's opened up their computer and seen who we're looking at. We're looking at, of course, of Glen Ella, the 2008 Olympic gold medalist in double trap. Now, people are going to say, but hang on, you said the criteria for this was that they must have won a world championship and an Olympic medal. Well, here's the news, and in case you don't know, if you go and look at the 1996 World English Sporting Championships, you'll see that Glenn <laughs> Ellick was World Junior Champion in English Sporting. So that is why he is joining us. Glenn, really great to have you with us today. Glad to be here. Do you remember the 96 World English Sporting Championships? Most people, when they win a Junior World Championship, they're expected to go on and become a sporting shooter. That's the last mention we ever have of you in the sporting world. Yeah, I actually uh, won the British Open the next year, but yeah, I went straight on. I guess it was about two weeks after I watched you win your gold and then went to England and shot. And I remember a little bit of it. I'm glad I inspired someone. I actually did see some <laughs> yeah. footage in a photograph recently and your head is certainly there in the background. I think you may have had Danny Carlisle with you in the... Tell me, do you shoot any other disciplines of shooting anymore before we start talking about your career? Sometimes I'll shoot some pigeons and some fun sporting stuff, but um, give it about six more years and retire from the Army, and then I'll start doing a little more. I'm sure all the sporting shooters will love to know that, that you think it's fine yeah. to take up your sporting career when you hit about 50 years of age. So <laughs> I'll look forward to it. Glenn, um, the first time I met you was 1999. It was in Peru at a World Cup. Um, you were a little bit like Lakatos. I could hear you before I could see you. <laughs> you, you, you certainly had a personality like Josh Lakatos. You were very friendly to everyone. And you were shooting trap and double trap back then, but uh, obviously right. you went on to specialise in, in double trap. Was Peru your first ever time that you represented the United States overseas? That was my first World Cup. And you didn't shoot too badly at it, but you obviously learned a lot from it because it didn't take long. You made the Olympic team the following year in Sydney and it probably wasn't the greatest event you've ever shot in, but the learning curve was well and truly on its way up by the time that you arrived home from Sydney. And it didn't take long. Then, uh, two years later, you were a world championship medalist. The influence, and I've mentioned him already, that Dan Carlisle had over you, it must have been enormous. Yeah, I mean, we, I started working with Dan in 98 and worked with him once a month normally for four or five days. And we spent a lot of time in Atlanta training, spent a lot of time at Fort Benning. Uh, what was a typical training day like for you then? How many rounds or what type so of training were you doing? On a three-day weekend, we'd shoot 1,000 on Friday, 1,000 on Saturday, and 500 on Sunday for... You know, every day just wear you out, but it, it really worked. We'd get on and we'd shoot 500 in the morning, break for lunch, come back, shoot 500 in the afternoon, do that for three days. It hurt. In station work, Glenn, or just in rounds? Um, and that was Atlanta. Most of it was rounds, but Carlisle always is shoot it again, shoot it again, shoot it again, shoot it again. So until we'd work it out and then keep doing rounds. I just needed, at that point, I needed to get my comfort zone up. I could shoot, but I need to get my scores up and be comfortable shooting though in the 140s every time. We do a lot of technical videos, and I know that Russell's mentioned you particularly in one, and that's for the length of pull on your score. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> you have the longest length of pull of anyone I have ever seen. Um, is gun fit something that you've always put a bit of emphasis on, or once you've got a gun that works for you, you just keep it and then blame the shooter? I've switched guns probably five times in my career and some of it they changed the game so we had to go to the high rib um when i switched over to trap i grabbed my old um grabbed my old double trap gun with the low rib found a different stock slapped it on and went away with that 
It's uh, interesting you brought up the guns. The first time I think we met in Peru, I think you were using maybe a cola. Was it a cola? I was using a cola. And then you went to a Parazzi and had a lot of success with Parazzi and obviously mm -hmm. you won the Olympics with Parazzi. But then um, you crossed over and shot a Beretta. H how did you find swapping brands of guns all the time? It didn't really bother me. Once you get a gun fit to you and, you know, I was getting a new gun for a new reason. So going to the high rib or going to longer barrels or short, just doing something that it didn't matter, swapping the brands. Um, I was lucky enough to spend a lot of time with you, training even at, at your range, um, your father's range up in <laughs> Texas. I don't know who. I think, Is that what that was, training? <laughs> yeah. I think my younger son was actually conceived there. <laughs> Sorry, I missed the memo on that. I didn't know we were there. <laughs> but um, I always found... I always found you interesting because I sort of categorise shooters into two halves, as a lot of people do. Uh, people that know a lot about the technique and need to know about where their gun's shooting and the other people that don't care less. And, you know, you certainly knew a lot about shooting. And at one stage when I was coaching James Willett, I said, if you're struggling overseas, the only person I'd go and get you to speak to is Glenn Eller because he actually knows what he's doing. But you take a lot of pride in setting a lot of this up yourself and you've spent a lot of time on the pattern board. Tell us about your gun setups. What point of aim are you shooting at in, in what were you shooting in double trap and what are you shooting now in Olympic trap? So doubles I shot, I like mine to be 60, 40, maybe a touch higher. Uh, both barrels shoot in the same spot. Um, and bunker, I'm pretty much exactly the same. I just like to have my eye above the rib and the gun to shoot where I look. I actually had some issues with it. <laughs> so I got my barrel all set up. It was good. Went to selection match and went to the patterning board because I was struggling. I was like, something's wrong. Like I'll hit, you know, one round, I'll smoke every straightaway. And the next one, I can't touch one. So I got on the patterning board and it went from anywhere from 80% left to 80% right to 100% high and just buried all over the place. Why? So what happened? The side ribs had come loose and it just, it just wouldn't hold. Wow. I had no clue. I've never had it happen before. And then had it, um, Briley rebuilt it in five days, got it back to me. And then right before Olympic trials, those barrels blew up. <laughs> the cording split and, uh, yeah, somebody got behind a choke and blew it. So then I got to a different barrel and they were, the first barrel was like 80% high and the second barrel was 50, 50. So I couldn't hit my ass. No. Oh, I didn't know that. I certainly knew that you'd blown a barrel up, but I didn't realize it was yeah. that particular time. Um, I mean, I knew, I always knew Glenn, you wanted to be just like Russell. Uh, <laughs> I know. <laughs> you know I, I recall a very similar situation happening to him. So it does happen. That was 2004. Yeah. Unfortunately, at sometimes the worst time, but uh, have you got it all resolved now? So I took the barrel that I had set up to match that one, and I had some issues with it and it wasn't really shooting the same spot. Sent it to Briley and got them to rework it. I just got it back probably three months ago, and it's shooting great. The lead up to the Beijing Olympics, and you shot brilliantly over there. You didn't shoot great in Athens and you had some health issues. Uh, and I think that's for the public record. You went through a, a really bad time, but you sorted everything out. Were you surprised how well you shot in Beijing? I mean, it's a well, tough question have... because you were expected to win, in my opinion. And I, I shot in the final right beside you. You didn't have the greatest start to a final I've ever seen, Glenn. But <laughs> yeah, you didn't, you didn't get... either on that one. No, no, I think I showed you the <laughs> You, you shot the final after you missed the first pair brilliantly. And the right guy won the Olympic Games. But it doesn't always happen that way. But talk about your build-up to Beijing. Because when you arrived there, you were on fire. So, I mean, it started joining the Army two years prior to that. So getting in there with my teammates and being able to train every day together and push each other, um, we came right out of the gates and we all started winning. So working with them day in, day out, and then you know, I think right before we went to Chang Wan, Korea, where I've had a lot of success and got some great training in with Jeff. And then once we got over there, we just fed off each other and we were able to roll. And I knew if I could just get out of my own way, finally in the Olympics, I'd win one. But 
I figured I needed to probably win that one or it never happened. Uh, speaking of the Army life, can you give us a bit of an understanding why you went into the Army and also what day is like for you? So when I first joined, I, I was living in Houston and Kiever called me and was like, hey, what are you doing for the next two years? going to school and shooting so he he convinced me to come in because Jeff was coming in and we joined joined 14 years and three days ago I'm not counting down or anything but. <laughs> <laughs> so normally in the mornings when we're training hard get up do some PT in the morning train till you know three three o'clock in the afternoon so um, and trap right now on a good day I'll shoot 250 birds um, and doubles, we'd normally shoot anywhere from a course of fire, depending on what we're working on, up to four or five hundred. You've you've got to think though, Glenn. The team that you guys had there with uh, for quite some time was Jeff, Josh, Richmond, and yourself. Um, the fact that you three are seeing each other every day, you can't get a better training environment than what the U.S. Army Marksmanship Unit provided for you. And I would think if you can train with those people, you're no doubt going to get better. And you're living proof that joining the Army it helped you achieve your goal. Um, you say you might be counting down the days now to get out of them. <laughs> you know, it, it, do you feel that you're burned out now in shooting? Uh, not necessarily. Um during this time, of course, because we can't go anywhere, do anything. Well, we're here now, but we're starting to finally be able to travel. During that time, it was kind of nice to take a break. Um, wouldn't necessarily say burn out, but getting some time off and just waiting until we know, hey, we've got this match. This one means something. You can get geared up for it. But just getting geared up to shoot day in, day out with nothing to shoot for, I, I'm burnt out on that. So if you um, met a young, aspiring 17-year-old that wanted to shoot skeet um, or trap, it doesn't matter, would you still recommend that they, if they're unsure what they want to do in their career, to go down the path of the U.S. Army Marksmanship Unit? If they can meet the criteria to, for us to hire them, yeah, no doubt. As long as they've, you know, they've got to meet the physical standards of being able to join the Army, they've got to have the right mental side to be able to just be in that room with everybody so they've got to be a fit for the team but you know they're the right person absolutely Glenn I'm just interested because you've been in the sport for quite some time and you've seen it change a lot throughout the time that you've been shooting you know, social media is a big influence now for a lot of shooters how do you feel that that's changed and does it add additional pressure to shooters going into events knowing that they need to be more present on social media it doesn't do anything to me because I don't ever post anything. So you see it with other athletes, though. I mean, you're around a lot and you're seeing how it's moving through. I kind of just turn a blind eye to it, so I don't follow a ton of people on like Instagram. Um, normally, when we're doing it. Like Lance will get on there and put stuff out. Lance is addicted to <laughs> is addicted to Instagram. So the reason Lauren's saying that is that we just did a recent interview with Josh Lakatosh, and he was really strict about it. He said, you know, virtually that all the athletes when they go to the Olympics should leave their phones at home because it's become the biggest distraction. What he actually said is, is that if he was ever going to coach anyone ever again, he would only do it on the premise that they could be locked in a compound with their social media and phone devices somewhere else. And I, I see that, you know, you're out there instead of watching targets or watching people shoot, people are just on their phone nonstop. I, I'm guilty of it a lot, but it, I guess it is what it is with the times. Yeah, it's, it's, it's sad in a lot of ways. Um, okay, you, you've had an opinion in the past on how Double Trap uh, should have evolved. Uh, I'm interested in your thoughts on the changes, first of all, they made in Double Trap, uh, the changes then secondly to the final system, and what your views are, thirdly, on the IWSF's decision to finally get rid of double traps. So first of all, how the event evolved. What did you think of them bringing in the, uh, well, first of all, the timed release, the timer on the, and, and then the random pair release. What did you think there? Did you think that made it hard for a new shooter, not an army shooter, someone that's got to pay their own practice, to then take up the sport because it become a very technical discipline once they started bringing in all these changes. So I thought what it did when they first brought in the delay, it kicked out all the 
trap shooters. Some of them were able to stay right at the beginning, but um, I always liked it when it changed because I knew I could put in the time and work and both the times I won the world championship or the first year they came out with new rules. So I've actually enjoyed it. And the, the random pairs then later on, um, because that added a new element and you needed, if you didn't count pairs, then you were out. If you didn't have the ability to stand out there under pressure and know exactly what your last five pairs were, you weren't going to win anything. What did you think of that? I've really, that, that was probably my favorite way they did the game because it wasn't just the same monotonous. You actually got out there, the rounds only took 12, 13 minutes and you could get up, focus once you got through the first pass. You had a clear path of what you knew you had to do to get out. And I actually really enjoyed that. It, it just made it a harder game and you had to be able to point the gun. And the final system on top of that, you've seen them all. You've pretty much... Oh, I didn't, I didn't like that final system. <laughs> no, I, I haven't met an athlete, Glenn, to be honest, that actually likes the final system where you give up your qualification. I think yeah, everyone it understands does. why. But oh, I'm interested in what your views on what they should have done. And even now, with Olympic prep, where, what final system do you think we actually need to end up adopting? So I... The, to answer the first part, the, the final system they went to was total bullshit because you, hit, you could break the most targets in the final and lose and come in fourth, not even medal. So you're talking about the final system where you shot an extra 16 pairs of targets. After yeah, the, the, I thought that was awful. You know, and skeet, 16 birds, what's that going to do? Yeah, Vincent then, Hancock had exactly the same opinion of that. that yeah. you did. The new <laughs> final system, I... I at least think it's fair because when you're overseas, it's not fair when you're at a small match and the scores are 30 targets apart. But when it's within one bird or two birds to get in, you're pretty much on a level playing field. And then the only thing I think they should change with that is they need to flip the order of the shooters. Top place shooter needs to go last instead of going first. For what reason? Same reason every other sport does that. Yeah, <laughs> Your best guy always goes last. Yeah, I mean, it, and you'd get some bonus, obviously, to have a look at five other shooters shoot before you do instead of get thrown yeah. into the deep end. Yeah. Yeah. Um, your thoughts on what they did with Double Trap? Uh, they, first of all, I think, this is just my opinion, I thought they made a mistake when they took women out and made it a men's only event. But what's your thoughts on what the IWSF did and just throwing it out and then replacing it with a mixed pairs trap event and with what it was coming down i don't think they really had a choice i mean they could have done a mixed pairs doubles event but who's going to train you know for four years to do something that's it's pretty much an individual sport but you got a you know a partner shooting next to you so i think that was pretty much the only thing they could do is get rid of doubles if they have to have some sort of team event they could have done skeet or trap traps got more participation so i understand it going being a mixed team trap I think they've done the right thing, but of course it was hard to get a bunch of people to learn that when you know they've shot doubles their whole career and you take it away from them. Can I just take us back a little ways? I hate to go back to the beginning, but I spent a lot of time with you at the U.S. Training Center in the early days. And I have a huge interest now that I've moved to Australia in terms of the development of the sport. And in America, we have a really good system, in my opinion, in terms of the best way to pull people that are already skilled in another discipline, foster them through, and then put them with other like-minded juniors and keep pushing them through um, in that way. And that's where I was lucky enough to spend a bit of time with you. How do you feel about the U.S. development system? Do you think it's right? And as far as the depth, do you think it helps create the depth at the bottom? I thought... When, they, when we went to more of a point system, I thought that hurt our depth because you're going to lose shooters. If you're only catering to the top guys, the young guys are never going to stick around. Um, we've gone back to a full selection process like we had in the past, and that's, it gives everyone a chance. So they can see, hey, if I work and if I shoot the scores, I get to go. So I think that really helps. And having you know, our trap matches now have – 150 people at them where even when we were shooting it was like you know 60 or 70 
So our game's really grown over here, which is a good thing. Glenn, um, I've asked this question to quite a few of the US shooters, so I'll ask it to you because you've touched on it now. Um, I asked Vincent and obviously Kim, who have both missed out on teams, Kim missing the Olympic team this year and Vincent missing the World Championship team last year. And I've asked this question to Josh and I will ask it to Danny, but you're probably the best person to ask it to. The Italians have a selection policy for their Olympic Games, which is entirely picked inside a room. Um, they, they look at all the scores, obviously, that they've shot, but the coaches pick the team. The US have, for this time around, they had a totally first past the post, 500 targets plus the finals added together, and it, it, whoever hit the most went. For the good of winning a gold medal, not for the good of the sport, for the chances of winning a gold medal, who's got the better system in your opinion? I like our system better because you're going to, your top guys still have to work every time. Um, I think you could, there are ways to modify it that it could be fair. And, you know, we have to go off what the ISSF does. So if they come out with some crazy thing on world ranking, that's going to change what our system is. But however we can make the fairest way to make the team, then the juniors and all that coming up know all I got to do is beat them and I get to go. I, I enjoy that system. And I think that's what you've said. Um, and you've built the sport up because of that system. You wouldn't have 150 people at your trials as such. If, if you're not doing anything with it, no. No, no you'd, you'd have 20 people and maybe 10 if they already knew yeah. who the team was before, before you went. No, it's an interesting answer and it's a, it's a common theme that we've asked everyone so far. And it's interesting, no two people have really had exactly the same idea. And that really tells me there is no perfect system. There can't be. I mean, you know, everyone's different. We all do different things. Um, you know, I've got different ideas than other people. I know probably just because of when I came up, I, if that's the way it was, I probably wouldn't have made the world, the Olympic team in 2000, but because it was a merit based system, I was able to just, you know, go shoot and make the team. The day that you heard the double trap was no longer an event and that you'd be, if you were to stay shooting competitively for the United States, you would have to shoot either skeet or Olympic trap. Well, obviously, you've had a bit of a background in Olympic trap. But, Glenn, not too many double trap shooters have gone on and been able to change their careers. Not out of the last crop of double trap shooters. I mean, Andy Lowe from Germany, I see, is doing okay. And you've had some great results. In 2018, you shot the highest qualification score at the World Championship and, and didn't have a great final, but you, uh, you proved that you could shoot it. And then at the Cat Games, you shot 124 out of 125 and were unlucky not to win a quota. But did you find it hard to go and just accept that the event that I'm an Olympic gold medalist is no more? And now if I want to keep continuing to shoot around the world, I have to learn this game properly. Because you, you were never really a great Olympic trap shooter, but you always had the potential. No, you weren't. Right. I mean, it's just I, mean I stopped when I was 17. So. Yeah, that's it. So you had the background. Tell us, though, how much time did it take to really learn how to compete in Olympic trap? So I felt um, within the first four or five months, I was able to, to shoot some good scores. Actually, the first competition I went to um, was the Golden Bear out in Colorado, the Maple Leaf, one of the two, and shot a 92, like, on, like whatever the prelim was, shot okay, shot a 92 on the first day and then shot a 98 the last day. Like, okay, I think I can do this. So, you know, 95 average. I think you shoot 95 average and trap in the U.S. across the board, you're going to have some good scores. Yeah, I mean, you had no trouble knowing how to compete. It was just being able to compete under, under pressure. But another question that I've asked um, quite a few of the people that have been on these shows from the U.S. was at a time that you were involved in the sport in 2008 and 2012, when the U.S. men's Olympic trap team was non-existent at the Olympic Games. What was really the reason behind that? I find it hard to believe it was a lack of depth in the USA, 
but you didn't you guys just didn't compete well at the events where there were quotas on the line. And after you didn't win a quota at the Cat Games this year, I thought you were guys were trying to make this three times in a row. But what's your yeah. opinion on it? You were involved in the Army Marksmanship Unit. In that room, it must have been a very bleak time to be a US men's crap shooter. It was, and I think um, that's when they changed the final system. I think that made it tough, like for us at Cat Games or Pan Ams, you'd go to the match and shoot the highest score like Jake Wallace did it. He shot a 125, then shot a 15, and then got beat on the last one, no quota. So um, I think we just had – we kind of lost our, you know, our younger generation, the guys that were 20, 21, 22. You know, coming out of juniors, they've either got to make the step up or go do something else, go to college, go to work. And we just kind of lost a, you know, a generation in there. That I think that really hurt us for those couple of years. Are you saying the generation because of Josh and Lance and Brett Erickson, they'd stayed on maybe for one Olympics too long? Are you suggesting that? I don't. I don't think that's the case. But I, I think we we struggled developing the next crop of shooters. So, and you know, we lost them for those few years. So it's taken some time to get it back, but I think we're back in the right direction. Do you have any idea how many bunker or trench or Olympic trap layouts there are in America? I would guess, you know, full big places where you can hold matches. We've only got, you know, Fort Benning, uh, Tucson here in Colorado Springs and Texas. So Hillsdale's building a bunch of nice stuff. Yeah, West, Palm Palm West Palm Beach is putting in five bunkers. Um, that. I think we've got, we're going to have quite a few places and some places we can shoot different weather and uh, different backgrounds that I think that'll really help us traveling overseas. Yeah, that's the reason that I was asking because I just wonder sometimes if the depth of problem comes from lack of access. You know, it's important to train, but it's also important to be competing and to be able to go to a weekend event and train or compete in a, at an actual Olympic trap layout, if there are yeah you know, hours away from a house or in another state could be really challenging. I just don't, mm -hmm. I just feel like there's got to be a little bit more to the lack of depth when you've got such a strong ATA, you know, community, you know, sporting shooters, the depth's huge, skeet shooters, the depth's huge. I just wonder if that, that might be the reason why. I think when we have more and the people seeing the success of Derek Mine coming out, you're going to have more people show up and, Right now, our feeder system is more um, SCTP. So we're getting some young kids, getting them exposed, but they haven't been winning on you know a big national stage yet. So having someone like Derek being able to show sporting shoes, hey, if you want to do it, you can. Come on over. So I think that's going to help us with our depth too. Lynn, would you um would you encourage a young and up and coming ATA shooter still to get the competition base? in the domestic disciplines of trap before they crossed over to Olympic trap? I'd say learn how to win first, then come over here. It's hard to learn how to shoot this game and win at the same time. Yeah, it's a, it's a common theme that we're hearing from a lot of people. Um, a lot of our followers are very technically based people. Uh, can you just tell us a little bit more about your gun? First of all, what's the overall weight of it? I know my barrels are like six, 1,600 or 32 inch uh, Parazzi MX-8. They're around they're probably 15 7 to 1600 uh, i've got a huge stock on there now i need to actually trim it down i had it done it's just um i need to take some weight off of it it's a little heavy but it's not bad it's like a it's 16 and a half inch length of pull is it balanced glenn is it balanced over the the hinge pin of the gun and with that amount of wood need, pull up, it'd be hard i need to take a little weight out of it still i just haven't done it yet um when I got this stock built, I said, just make everything huge on it and I'll whittle away at it until I get it where I want. And uh, do, does your gun have chokes? It does. I've got Briley thin walls in it. I like the thin walls and Parazzi's because you can, you don't have the big belt, you know, the barrel. And I think it, um, I think they balance out a little better that way. What chokes are you running? Glenn in the bottom barrel and in the top. So I believe I haven't measured them. When I got these barrels redone, I had them blow them out. Uh, like 5,000, so they should be I-Mod and Lightful, but they're Mark Mod and I-Mod. 
you were, um, mentioned before you're at Colorado Springs at the moment. Um, and I always found the scores that you guys shot there phenomenal. Um, and largely it's due to the altitude. Do you lighten your chokes up when you shoot at Colorado Springs? I normally don't because I put them in there. I've got confidence with them. So I just roll with it. And seeing all the black smoke is really nice. Do you think, though, that the fact that you guys shoot a lot of your selection matches on that range can be detrimental to you? Because the difference between Fort Benning and Colorado Springs is phenomenal. You know yourself that you'll get away with murder at Colorado Springs, but you, you make one false move at Fort Benning and the party's over. Do you think that can be a problem for you guys? I actually like having matches in Colorado Springs. and we've, I've talked with Lance about it a lot. And Colorado Springs makes you be technically perfect. If you can be technically perfect, you're going to break high scores. Um, when you're not, you'll shoot the same scores I'll shoot at Benning. And that's how I can tell if I'm really shooting well, because I'll throw huge scores here and shoot normal scores at Fort Benning. Shoot, you know, 120, 121 and trap. And then up here would be 123, 124. And when your scores are the same, it's tough. But getting back to having selection matches here, I like it because you – those are scores you have to shoot to win overseas. So you got to be able to prove you can do that. And then also shoot on tough ranges. So having one here and having one in Tucson or one here, Fort Benning, I, I actually really like having it. And out here with trap, your days are so long, you get all sorts of conditions here. Wind from every different direction, rain. Um, it, no. it can be tough. It's, yeah, you get snow. Um, so I, I I think it's good to have it here. Just um, an, another technical question on your gun set up in Olympic trap compared to double trap. You touched on your double trap gun was shooting about 60, 40. In Olympic trap, are you, have you got it shooting any lower? It's about the same. And it, I've you know, shot the same way for so long that as long as my eyes sitting just on top of the rib, I can see the rib. And, and, and you're holding above the trap when you call for the target or on, on the lip of the trap. I'm holding on the lip and trying to look inside the house. Trying to think the house has got a glass roof on it. And <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's, it's interesting with the amount of people that we ask that and the varying answers we get. And you mentioned Derek, he, he said he changes his hold depending on the conditions from he's been as high as parallel. And now he's about half a meter above the roof, but there is no one technique that suits everybody. And you're living proof of that. All that matters is you can, that what your style is matching up with how you're looking at the targets. So if I try to look high or do anything like that, I get a total disconnect. So the closer I look, as long as I can pick it up there, I'm looking as tight as I can. So your gun, the end of your barrel and your eyes are always connected, no matter where you put your gun. They're pretty close. If it's really windy, like a crosswind and my gun's blowing all around, I'll move them up to get rid of that connection so I don't see the gun blowing around. And then I'm going to miss a few targets like that. But if I was seeing my gun blowing around, I was going to miss a whole lot more. There's two things in my life that I've been worried about when I've heard your name brought up. Um, the first, when I heard you were joining the army and there was a chance that you would be defending my life because we'd rely on the USA a lot over here in Australia. <laughs> okay, I, I lived with that. And I think for your shooting, it was fantastic that you joined the army. The second time that I was worried, though, I heard you've got a pilot license and I'm terrified <laughs> that I'll walk into a jet one day and you'll be there at the front flying it. But uh, That's your hopes. <laughs> um, I remember actually getting in a plane with you once and uh, we flew somewhere up in, in Texas, but you mm -hmm. weren't flying it. But you obviously had the passion to get your license for quite some time. How are you enjoying that, Glenn? So I'm loving it. So my dad had that that same plane that Dwayne had when I was growing up and I just loved flying. I always thought my hearing was too bad and they weren't going to let me get a medical. And then I read what it actually was. You have to sit in a quiet room with your back turned five feet away from someone. So if you can just hold a normal conversation, you can get it. So a good friend of mine let me borrow his plane and take lessons in it. And so I got my license uh, almost two years ago. And well, since then, he's moved up to North Carolina and took the plane with him. So right now I'm in the market. So if anyone out there knows of a good plane for sale, uh, hit me up. I'm, I'm looking. <laughs> hey, there you go. Go shooting is now in the 
uh, the, the plain brokering business. We only charge five percent. I reckon if you went in that to that room with a person that you had to turn your back on and just listen to them, take Lance with you because you could be five rooms over and you'd hear Lance. So it's good to see Lance back involved with the team, though. And I. I always mm -hmm. thought Lance was one of the smoothest shots I've ever seen. but And he was a great all-round shooter. He could shoot double trap as good as trap. How's his influence been back in the U.S. team? It's been great. So he's been traveling to all the matches. And his knowledge and being able to watch you when you're competing and stand behind you training, uh, he can pick stuff out so little. And just the way he talks to you about it, hey, this is what we're going to do. Yeah, you screwed that up. All right, let's work on this. He always comes up with something different and you know better ways to approach it and having him and jay waldron up here um they're great they take care of all the shooters they work their butts off and they're making the team a fun place to be you spoke before about the army and counting down the days what do you plan on doing once you're out of the army do you plan on shooting you know you said you said you're gonna plan on shooting some more sporting but what's life gonna look like for you after that so we'll see. Um, I'll probably move back to Houston. Um, not 100% sure yet, but that's where I'd like to end up. That's where my family's at. So it'd be good to be there. I'd like to shoot some pigeons and some sporting and just enjoy it. Your dad's got a shooting range in Houston. Can you see yourself being the general manager and loading sporting traps for the rest of your life? I don't see myself doing that. <laughs> I got to figure out a way to go make some money. Just throwing that out there, I bet Butch would be happy to hear that too. Hey, um, yeah. what did you um, what did you think about Kim missing out on the Olympic team? It says a lot about the depth that the USA women are now providing in skeet in the United States because Kim didn't shoot badly, but the girls that made the team shot superbly, and that's got to be obviously a testament to the depth that you guys got. But Kim's not only missed out; four other world champions have missed out on making the US women's ski team. That must be, Glenn, in your opinion and mine, the hardest team to make in the shooting world. It's got to be. I mean, we've literally had like we've got eight women that we know can win on any given day at the Olympic Games. We can only take two of them. So the best thing to do is let them fight it out and the best get to go. Um, you know, it sucks Kim didn't make it, but she's not going anywhere. She'll still be around. You can bet. The smartest thing Lauren ever did was leaving. <laughs> He's <laughs> yeah. that make me feel better about the circumstances of being locked up in Melbourne with him. That's all. That's what <laughs> <laughs> Glenn, it's been a real pleasure to catch up with you again. And I know that the Glen Ella story isn't over yet. Um, and it, it will be an interesting time for you after the, they finally run the Tokyo Olympics to see how the last years in your army uh, evolve. And hopefully then you can try for the Paris team. But it is now the fact that LA having a, an Olympic Games. Is that something in the back of your mind that you think, God, I need to try and stay around for a home Olympic Games, then retire? Yeah, I haven't really thought about it. I, you know, I get my 20 in in 2026. Two more years. Maybe, but I, I can tell myself I'm going one more. And, you know, if I happen to do it after that, we'll see. But right now I'm just focused on the next one. I think with an Olympic Games, two world championships, six World Cup gold medals, You've got two World Cup final globes, something that Vincent Hancock hasn't got. <laughs> so you've got something that he hasn't that you'll have over him until he finally gets his hand on one. I don't think you've got too much to prove. Glenn, really great to catch up with you and uh, we look forward to seeing how the next few years uh, go for you. Y'all too, and glad y'all are surviving quarantine and y'all haven't divorced yet. <laughs> In fact, I haven't shot him yet. It's a miracle. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Glenn. Great to have you on the show. Uh, no problem. Yeah, glad to be here.